So I'm delighted to be kicking off this series of four seminars and to be chairing the first seminar today. Um, so Rob, if you want to put up the first slide, um, just to remind everybody the name of the, the series. And the starting point for this series is the entwined nature of three major threats to population and planetary health, which are infectious disease, non-communicable disease, and the climate and environmental emergencies. And they've got common drivers, um, two of them being uh, unsustainable farming practices and um, uh, subsidies on, on fossil fuels. So they've got those shared common drivers. And if we could identify some of the synergistic actions that could work across those, that has the potential to be transformative. But as we all know, um, identifying what action to take on its own is rarely enough. Um, we need to make the case for action. And that really is how to achieve those, that, that change. And that really is the focus of this seminar series. And um, Rob, could you give me the next slide, please? Um, so um, the four seminars, um, well, the first one today, we're going to be looking at how to frame action in, in action to see the extent to which that can increase the likelihood that effective action will be implemented. The second seminar is going to be focusing much more on public participation. And the third one, looking at um, the importance of place in achieving change. And the fourth seminar, I just want to highlight that one because that is going to um, bring together the preceding three seminars. And uh, importantly, if your eyesight is good enough, you can read along the bottom line, the name of our four students at Christ who've won the competition that we set up as part of this seminar series to take part in this final seminar and to um, write up what we discuss across the seminar series. And that is absolutely vital. Um, we're going to be thinking about uh, intergenerational justice and uh, like it or not, uh, you the students are the next generation that are going to be uh, carrying the baton for what it is that we're going to be discussing in these first three seminars. And I should also say we're delighted that Fiona Harvey, who's a Christ alum and a, a prize winning uh, correspondent, uh, environmental correspondent working for The Guardian, is also going to join that panel. So um, next slide, please. Um, what I now want to do is to turn to today's seminar and our distinguished um, panelists, um, both uh, Diane Coyle and Michael Marmot, who are international leaders in the field and importantly have written very eloquently and passionately about what is wrong um, and importantly have both got visions about how we might do things better. So Diane has talked about um, building forward uh, and Michael has talked about building back fairer. So I'm just going to say a few words of, um, to highlight uh, aspects of each of their biographies and then come on to ask them both to kick off this um, session with answering a couple of questions. Um, so Dan is the inaugural Bennett Professor of Public Policy here at the University of Cambridge and co-directs the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. She's also a director of the Productivity Institute, ESRC funded, recently set up, which aims to better understand, measure and enable productivity across the UK with a view to improving living standards as well as well-being. And she's also an expert advisor on the National Infrastructure Commission. Amongst her many public roles, um, she served on the Natural Capital Committee and some of that work may come into the discussion this afternoon and is a formal advisor to the UK Treasury. In addition to 
her innovative and highly valued work as an economist, um, she stands out, certainly for me, in her ability to communicate economics ideas in an accessible way. And um, just as a small evidence of that, and I, I think we'll see more of that this afternoon, um, one of the reviews on her book, uh, GDP, uh, subtitle, A Brief But Affectionate History, was described uh, in the Wall Street Journal as a little charmer of a book. So beat that, uh, other economists. Um, turning now to, to Michael Marmot, who is a professor of um, epidemiology and public policy, uh, no, epidemiology and public health um, at uh, University College London. And also, uh, he directs the UCL Institute of um, Public Equity. And Michael has led on four um, very important uh, reports over the last 12 years, um, starting off in 2008 with the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. Uh, that was called Closing the Gap in a Generation. Um, and then at the request of the British government, uh, he conducted a strategic review of health inequalities in England called Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And that was published, I think, in February 2010. And then 10 years later, in February um, uh, in 2020, um, so just um, under a year ago, I don't think this was commissioned by the government, but um, he went back to look at what had happened 10 years on, and that report was called Health Equity in England, Marmot Review 10 Years On. Um, and I, barely pausing, I, he then published another report in December called Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. So I'm sure we'll be hearing uh, some of the top line from those reviews as we go on. So um, I want to start, um, as I said, I've asked Michael and uh, Diane to, to kick us off uh, with um, just possibly five minutes each to give us a, a top line to um, uh, a ghastly exam question that I set, um, which is to give us a thumbnail sketch on what you think in order to have a healthier, fairer and sustainable future, what are the key actions that are needed and who needs to act? Um, and what metrics do we currently have, do we currently use to measure that as a basis for assessing uh, the costs and the benefits of action and inaction? So, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me sit, start with a, a negative. When I talk about health, I'm not talking about the health care system. I'm talking about the health of the population. So when I talk about trends in health, by and large, they have very little to do with what's happening in the health care system. The health care system is vital, as we can see with COVID-19, but by and large, it differences in access to quality health care are not the prime reason why we have trends in health status or inequalities in health. We produced three reports last year. The one that almost passed without notice in between the other two was sustainable health equity. It was actually showing how actions to reduce health inequalities could contribute to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So it was putting the inequalities in health agenda together with the climate crisis, the actions needed on the climate crisis. So let me start with the first one, the February um, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on, and looking back at what had happened. And what had happened was the slowdown in improvement in life expectancy, was, which was marked in England, was more marked in the UK than in any other rich country, except the United States and Iceland. Second, the social gradient in health, the more deprived the area, the shorter the life expectancy, that's our measure of inequalities, had got steeper. Inequalities were increasing. And third, life expectancy for people in the poorest decile outside London was going down. 
That's where we were before the pandemic. And we looked at the six domains of recommendations I'd made in my 2010 review, give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions, everyone having enough money necessary to lead a healthy life, healthy communities in which to live and work, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And Teresa, you'll have something to say on the last one. Um, but looking at what had happened, certainly to the first five, the trends over the decade were adverse. The highlight is if you ask, what did the government that was elected in 2010, what was its mission? If you listen to what they said, and it's a rare example, if you look at what they said and look at what they did, a rare example when they kind of match. What they said was they were in favor of austerity, rolling back the state, and they did. Public expenditure went from 42% of GDP in 2010, that 42% became 35% by 2019. And they did it in a most regressive way. The poorer the area, the greater the reduction in spending. So when you ask, thinking of your overall framing, given that our health situation was dreadful in the way I've described, and given that the government's major policy was to save money, was that a good trade-off? If we'd kept spending money the way we had in 2010, and I'm not gonna trespass on Diane's expertise, but certainly many economists uh, said that when you've got an economic downturn, that's the time to spend, not the time to save. If they continued to spend money, maybe health would not have stopped the improving, maybe health inequalities would not have increased to the same extent, and maybe health for the poorest people outside London would not have gone down. Then when we come to the report that we produced in December, Build Back Fairer, we said, we do not want to go back to the status quo. The status quo before the pandemic was terrible. And when you look at the inequalities in mortality from COVID-19, they almost exactly parallel to the inequalities in health more generally, which means that the causes of inequalities in COVID-19 overlap in large measure with the causes of inequalities in health more generally. There's some excess down the bottom because of employment in frontline occupations, living in multi-generational overcrowded households towards the bottom. But in general, if we want to deal with the inequalities in COVID-19, we have to deal with the inequalities in society. And of course, the inequalities then got exaggerated by lockdown, by the societal response. People at the bottom lost money, had more difficulty meeting needs. Marcus Rashford's become the most famous public health person post-war in Britain uh, because he thinks that poor children should be able to eat. What a radical idea. Um, and uh, education, the educational divide increased. I think economists talk about scarring. Um, there will be scarring that those inequalities will then track people through the life course. So building back fairer, I think, needs two kinds of approaches. One is to put equity of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy, not saving money, not getting the public finances in order as the overall goal of government policy, creating equity of health and well-being as the overall goal of government policy. And then at the other level, we've made a whole series of specific recommendations related to my domains of early childhood, education, employment, having enough money, healthy communities, and Teresa uh, creating the conditions for people to lead healthier lives. It means we need action along those lines from central government, from local government, from civil society. And it's not a mystery what we need to do. 
it may be a mystery how we get governments to act, but we've got the evidence and we can build back fairer. So, Michael, if I could just quickly, uh, uh, you've mentioned to ask you a little bit about metrics. So you've mentioned uh, counting deaths, counting disease, looking at the slope uh, of inequality. Um, of those, uh, and you've made a, a powerful uh, argument, uh, and in your reports, you, you make an argument based on uh, social justice uh, as much as anything else. Is, so a question maybe to return to is, is that enough? Um, do we, uh, for action, I don't know, do, do governments care? How can governments be helped to care? Well, my experience over the last decade is local government cares. Okay. Coventry declared itself a Marmot city. We're working with Greater Manchester. Um, they said they're a Marmot region. I asked them, I said, my wife has asked me if you would use some other name. Don't call it a Marmot region. She thinks this is malignant egomania on my part. And they said, too late. Uh, we're already calling it that. We're working, uh, Gateshead happily is not calling it Marmot, but they are using similar principles. So we're working quite effectively, I think, with local and regional government. National government shows little interest. Okay, um, so can I leave it there that um, local, yes, but national, and say so one of the questions that I really want to explore after Diane has spoken is whether or not there's a way of framing this that um, involves something other than millionaire footballers uh, in order to get action. So Diane, can I turn it? Thank you very much, Michael. That was a great uh, opening uh, set of uh, uh, evidences that, that you gave us. So Diane, can I turn to you to ask you to have a go at this? Thank you, Teresa. Um, it's a real pleasure to be taking part in this conversation. Um, we called our report Building Forward because we thought the status quo was not something desirable to get back to. And, um, you know, Marcus Rashford is obviously right to say children should be have food to eat. Um, it's a kind of universal moral um, statement that I think very few people would disagree with. And I start from the point of view that measurements and morals aren't mutually exclusive and the measurements are important because quantification has become a dominant tool in policy and business decisions. And it's part of the positivism and the rationalism of public philosophy um, uh, for 50 or 60 years. But that's not wholly a good thing because obviously there is a lot that we care about that is hard or impossible to measure. We wouldn't want to put any kind of numerical value on it. I think that approach is also in a retreat, actually, it's part of the attack on expertise, that, that that's fundamentally an attack on um, claims to being right on the basis of empirical knowledge. But I think the metrics, the measures are important for three reasons. One is that it is how we build knowledge in many domains, um, in science in economics and social sciences, uh, it is through empirical study. The metrics are also the lens through which collectively we see the world and what's happening. All kinds of things going on. It's very complicated. You can take different focal lengths. As, as um, national communities or, or public policy communities, we tell ourselves stories about what's happening. And those stories are shaped by the statistics that we use. And there are things that we might think are literally invaluable or priceless, but if you don't measure them, then they count as zero in decisions. The world's multidimensional. Uh, some things are, are we would want to make qualitative and, or moral decisions about and not quantitative ones, but decisions, certainly in public policy, are often binary ones. You do something or you don't. You make an investment or you don't. And I think the long reign of the quarterly increase in GDP illustrates the power of numbers to shape decisions and same is true in business as well. So in the Bennett Institute and in our report, we have been working on what we call the wealth economy framework. And that looks at a portfolio of different assets, which includes human capital, which includes health, includes social capital, institutions, knowledge, as well as conventional things like infrastructure and machinery. 
And the point about having um, a wealth framework or a balance sheet framework is that that embeds concern for the future because you are thinking about um, what's the trade-off between consuming today and having resources to consume tomorrow? Uh, what about what is going to be available for future generations to lead the kind of lives that they want to? So that's sustainability. You only get that if you're thinking about assets. And you can also then think about a portfolio and the way that these different things interact with each other. Um, so this allows us to shape a very different framework of choice for businesses or for uh, local or national governments. First of all, it makes it a, a positive thing to think to take longer term decisions. Because in the uh, GDP type approach, then a pound of investment is the same value as a pound of consumption. Um, we are saying that you're incorporating the future. So those two things have different valences attached to them. And this is just as true of public finance, actually, um, as any of the other uh, more material investments that I was talking about. So it's embed sustainability. Secondly, you improve returns or you can improve returns to today's, today's investments if you account for their interactions. So for example, if you're thinking as the government about investing in a new rail line, then that's going to boost productivity and incomes more if you also think about investment in skills for the people who live in the places along the rail line. And you get a higher return to that investment in skills if um, people have clean air or green space and are healthy. So it's not just what are their educational qualifications. And, and uh, you can think about um, then the interaction between the rail line and the public transport, the bike routes that you're put, putting in place. So you get a much better bang for the buck in public finances or business investments if you're thinking about these things together. And so the approach is about providing metrics of choice that are um, in a language understandable to economists and to people who work in the treasury um, to, for, to enable people to make the choices that they often in their heart feel are the right ones, but they feel trapped by having to deliver the bottom line in the profit and loss account or, or the increase in GDP. I do think local governments are more concerned. I've got long experience of working in Greater Manchester on the Independent Economic Review of 2009, which paved the way for the devolution deal and on their independent prosperity review early last year. And they are able to think more long-term. They are able to join up better across different domains of policy and, and to some extent, even different budget lines because that's very hard to do at the national level. They don't have enough levers of power to be able to do everything that they would want to. Um, but I think, I think they do um, care in a more immediate way. They have that granular information. They understand much better those multiple kinds of deprivation and inequality that Michael was talking about and the urgent need to address those if we're not going to see continuing polarization because the dynamics of the economy and these vicious and virtuous circles that get set up are that we're going to get more unequal unless we make some major interventions to, to stop that happening and change the dynamics. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and Thank you very much, Diane. That's um, beautifully explained. Michael, I wonder if you want to come back on any of that because Diane is um, encouraging us to measure because without measuring uh, health and health inequality uh, on, as, as an asset or health equity as an asset, it counts as zero. Do, can it, it, From what you've heard, do you think that there's a possibility that there could be more a national government buy-in if uh, inequality of, of health um, or health were uh, on the balance sheet? I feared this would happen, uh, that Diane and I are in great danger of agreeing with each other. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that, but I think we're on the same page. I measure things all the time. Uh, it's absolutely vital. The reason we know whether things are going in the right direction or the wrong direction is we measure things. I've been persuaded that that's not the only kind of knowledge. Some of the things that we don't measure, people's accounts of what's happening in real life are another form of knowledge that we do have to take into account. We don't have very good mechanisms for taking them into account, but absolutely vital. 
Um, whenever I'm giving a presentation, whether it's to a policymaker or to whomever, it's always got the data. Um, it's got the numbers, the absolutely vital part of the story. Now, they don't tell the story by themselves. We have to weave a story around those numbers, but absolutely vital. And the reason that we've got an outbreak of agreement between Diane and myself is that Diane's saying, yeah, but don't just measure the narrow economic side of it. Look more broadly. And I would guess that most of the things Diane is suggesting we measure are inputs into health. And what I should have said at the beginning, I look at health and health inequality. So I'm a doctor, public health, that's where I come from, that's what I do. But I've been arguing for a long time that the magnitude of health inequalities tells us a great deal about how well our society is doing. If health's improving, society's improving. If health's not improving, society's not. And if health inequalities are getting bigger, inequalities in key dimensions of society are getting bigger. And the way I know that is by measuring. But so, uh, just to you, I, so um, I'm not surprised there's agreement, uh, um, but just to push a little bit and uh, thinking about if one works in treasury and I think uh, Diane, you painted a, a very good picture that uh, people working there may well hold similar views to those of us in this conversation. But what, what is it that they need to see that they have not seen, let's make that assumption, uh, regarding the scale and the depth of health inequalities that means we're not seeing action. Well, and I'd really be interested what Diane has to say about this, but um, Nobel Prize winning economist in Chicago, I never thought I would quote a Nobel Prize winning economist from Chicago, um, Jim Heckman says that Investing in the first year of life is a rare example where equity and efficiency come together. He makes the economic case. I don't, I make the moral case, but he makes the economic case for investing in the first year of life. So if you were in the treasury and you wanted an economic case for investing in the first year of life, and I would argue the whole preschool period, you've got it, you should do it. What happened? in the decade that finished in 2020, 1,000 Sure Start Children's Centers closed, child poverty went up, which is to the detriment of early child development, um, and child poverty went up because of government policy. So it was actually a decision taken in the Treasury to increase child poverty. They didn't say that's what they did. But if you look at what the Chancellor did to taxes and benefits, Families with children, if they're in the bottom decile, got a 14% drop in income as a result of the changes the Chancellor made. And in the second bottom decile, they got a 12% drop. And in the third bottom decile, it was around 8% drop and so on. The richer they were, the less the drop. So the Chancellor took policies to increase child poverty. And that will have an adverse effect and have a long-term economic damage. No, um, so I don't know the extent to it. So Diane, do you want to come back on that? Do you think that there, there would be a better way of uh, framing this so that Treasury didn't make those mistakes? Um, yes, yeah, so economists on the whole are nice people with the social conscience. And um, I, I can't speak for conservative chancellors who have um, political views about it. But um, on the whole, I think it's not about not wanting to do the right thing. But there are several barriers. One, I think, is just a narrow range of experience among Whitehall civil servants. And that's part of the reason local officials have a much, um, a this has a much greater resonance with them. Because if you've got a nice middle class job in London and that's your experience of life, you just don't have the granularity of information about what inequality means to people. So it's, it, it's partly that, that issue. And economics itself has a real diversity problem, which many of us have been campaigning on. The second is about having permission to think in a different way. And that's why for me, the economic framework that we bring to bear 
is important because um, it will help give permission to officials to think in a different way about it. And that's a slow battle, starts with the, what they're taught in the undergraduate economics courses, but, but that is changing a bit, I think. The other issue that I think about a lot and goes back to your comment, Michael, about involving people is what data we take as the important data. You, as an economist, you're trained in a very technocratic way. You download your data from the internet without really questioning how that data got classified, how it got collected, and what it means when it's translated into outcomes of people's lives. And I'm therefore becoming much more interested myself in um, asking people um, what their experiences are, because that might change the kind of data that you want to collect and how you look at it. If you think about, as I do, public policies to make lives better, you've got to start asking really fundamentally, what does better mean and for whom? Because I can't do well-being to people. I have to know what they think about it. And so um, having started out as, as Mrs. Metrics, actually I'm moving much more towards um, a, a, a more qualitative approach as well as thinking about, about the numbers. But it's partly that um, people, people take data too much on trust and we need to think much more about how it comes about and what it tells us. I wonder if I'm thinking about uh, the wealth economy framework that you and others, Diane, have been working on. I wonder the extent to which other tribes could, could be joining that. So I'm thinking um, you know, Michael and others who are working on health inequality to actually um, uh, share uh, much more and for others outside of uh, economics do you start using this so that between us we've got uh, a, a common a common metric I think that could certainly add power um, it's inherently inherently interdisciplinary we yeah. start with natural capital that has to involve environmentalists yeah. you're thinking about intangible assets like data to include the technologists if you're thinking about human and social capital you've got to include health and public health yeah and because i'm I, I, well likewise um I, i've been saying that if you take actions on the social determinants of health there will be other benefits but i have quantified them to a lesser extent so for example it's highly likely that if you invest in early childhood you will get a reduction in crime um, both juvenile crime and crime later in life, because we know it tracks social disadvantage. So it's highly likely that you would get a reduction. I've not tried to quantitate that reduction. Now, if, if we adopted Diane's framework, uh, it might be that we could look at some of the other benefits. Um, I've already mentioned net zero greenhouse gas emissions as being vital. But we could look at reduction in crime, civil unrest. Uh, we could look, uh, Diane mentioned before, looking at skills and opportunities. There are other ways we could look at these benefits because I suspect the benefits of what I'm talking about in order to improve health and reduce inequalities have much wider benefits for society. I think that's absolutely right and that's one of the core conceits of the Lancet Chatham House Commission that I'm co-chairing with, with Harry Rutter um, is that uh, we can see co-benefits and uh, the central idea is that uh, Treasury and others who act um, are more interested in acting if you can get win-win-wins uh, across the piece. Um, I wonder if we should open up to questions, if you're both happy to do that, to continue um, the discussion. Right, I'll just try and... Uh, okay, um, I'm just going to read from the top and the first question from uh, Katie Tapper. Um, do we need higher taxes? And if so, how do we persuade people to vote for these? Hmm. Shall I start? Yeah, this, go for it, Dan. Yeah. This is not the time to be raising taxes. We're in the middle of what the Bank of England called the worst recession for 300 years. It would be absolute madness to think about it now. Um, apparently, there is some absolute madness going on in the government, but that's a different matter. Um, the, the, the question about public finances is about um, 
how much you have to repay and can you afford to repay it? And if you can use public money in such a way that you get a positive return and growth increases, then um, uh, you're, you're going to um, be in a better position to sustain the debt that's been incurred in the future. There are alternative approaches. You can raise um, taxes and cut spending. You can introduce inflation. You can default on debts. Those are much less attractive alternatives than investing well and um, getting the return for that investment. At the moment, um, this is absolutely the wrong time, even if you think that raising taxes has to happen, and I do think it has to happen, this is not the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Very, very clear. Michael, do you want to add to that? You're on mute, Michael. Yeah. Um, my understanding, and I'm sitting with a, a, an economist, but my understanding is when interest rates are zero, or even negative, uh, and the government shown it can print money as it did, um, despite dire warnings of runaway inflation, it printed money, it's called quantitative easing, um, to help the financial institutions. It can both borrow uh, when people are paying the government to keep their money, negative interest rates, and it can print money without raising taxes, as Diane said. I'm sure a fairer progressive taxation system is what we need in this country, but probably not right now, given the state of the public finances. Um, but so the argument, and I put it rhetorically, um, if you look at a measure of child well-being, I was looking at UNICEF's report card, I think the latest one is 15, that um, the UK ranks 27th out of 38 countries. The USA ranks 36th, so one is the best. Um, so we're near the bottom and the US is 36 out of 38. Now, it seems to me that's pretty important. Our kids have low levels of well-being. Uh, and it's not just because we're a poor country, because we're a pretty rich country uh, in terms of gross national income per person. We're a pretty rich country, but we seem to have decided that that's not a priority for us. Now, I don't particularly want to have an economic argument about whether for, there are good economic reasons why our kids should be miserable and have low levels of well-being compared with other rich countries. That's the wrong question. Can we afford it? It should be an absolute priority. Now, well, if an economist says to me, yeah, what are you prepared to give up uh, in order to achieve that? Yeah, quite a lot, actually, I'm prepared to give up. Like when the economy starts to recover, I'd give up some of my money. I'd pay more tax to achieve that. Um, I, I might give up quite a lot. That's a rather important societal goal. And if we rally around that important societal goal, then we can talk about, okay, how do we get there? And I think we do know how to get there. And yes, it will cost money, but it's worth it. Look at the outcome. Maybe, maybe I'm pinning too much on uh, the poor civil servant in the treasury as a sort of paradigm of, uh, as somebody has put in the questions and we'll come to this, a sort of top-down approach. Um, so uh, starting with Diane's view that uh, these are, people um, who reflect the values of society and their caring, compassionate people. Is there a way of presenting the case uh, for action that makes action more likely? Because I'm sure nobody in, very few people anyway, in Treasury would feel content with being, uh, what was it, 27th out of 38 countries. So I'm gonna leave that there, um, but that's really the, the question sort of um, echoing around in this seminar. I'm now going to come to a question from Charlie Kennel, who has uh, co-organized the, the seminar series. And uh, Charlie's asking a question of you, Michael. Um, so he's talking about Anne Case and Angus Deaton in the US have made a similar case, um, a similar case for, I, I assume, acting on inequalities. Uh, are there similarities and differences between 
the approach that they're arguing for and the one that you've been arguing for. I should say that um, Angus Deaton is leading a review on, I think it's social inequality with the um, Institute for Fiscal Studies at, at the moment. So um, Michael, it's uh, aimed at you, but Diane, you might want to come in as well. Um, yeah, if you'd asked me a few years ago, do Anne Case and Angus Deaton approach the world in the same way that I do, I'd say, would have said no. Um, I, here's the evidence that they approach the world in a different way to the way I approach it. Um, I reviewed their book for The Lancet, Deaths of Despair, um, very positively. What they show is a social gradient uh, by years of education, the rise in mortality from poisonings, suicide, and alcohol-related deaths, which they label deaths of despair, that rise in mortality is greater the fewer the years of education. It's a social gradient. They choose, so it's a marginal difference in approach. Rather than focus on the gradient, they focus on white men and women who do not have a four-year bachelor's degree. So I always look at the gradient they're looking at one, the, the sort of end of the gradient, but that's a marginal difference. And then they talk about psychosocial characteristics. They talk about the quality of life of those people. And I was just saying to a colleague this afternoon, if you watch, um, I thought Biden got it pitch perfect in his inaugural address and that young poet um, who was absolutely inspiring. And then you realize this is just simple humanity that feels like a revolutionary change. Now, what's gone on in the last four years in the US has been so God awful that normality feels revolutionary. We have to remember that the deaths of despair were rising dramatically during the sainted Obama's presidency. Um, it took off about the year 2000. And in fact, US life expectancy started lagging behind the other rich countries in the 1980s. So this was not a Trump phenomenon. And in fact, in the early Trump years, I said Trump didn't cause deaths of despair. Deaths of despair caused Trump. It was the kind of despair uh, of working class lives that Anne Case and Angus Deaton document brilliantly um, that kind of despair that might lead you to vote for a snake oil salesman who comes along and says, I feel your pain. So the US has had a long standing, long developing problem, which deaths of despair illustrates. They've got rid of this god awful president. Now they've got to go back to solving the long term problem. So we all feel relief. But, and it's a a prime example of what Diane said, and that I agreed with, of how the metrics are really very revealing. As we both said, the metrics aren't everything. Yeah. Um, the stories about people's lives are vital, but the metrics were very revealing. So I don't know, do, do you want to come in? Just very briefly, these are definitely long run trends. It dates back to deindustrialization in the late 1970s and early 1980s and the way the economy has, has changed since then, undermining not just the material goods that you can buy because you've got a good job, but that sense of purpose that people clearly get from work. One of the things that I'm interested in is the way that higher education has become a marker of the differences between people and the role that plays in, in people's sense of well-being, the way it shapes communities. I think there's a lot we need to understand there, but it's clearly an important thing that's coming out of, of the Deaton Review and, and um, the Case and Deaton book. Yeah, good. Um, we've got some great questions coming in, so I'm going to try and uh, move myself along. Um, so here's a question from Graham Pendlebury. Um, so he says, both speakers have aimed their comments at policymakers in, oh, I've now got, uh, sorry, both speakers aim their uh, policymakers in central and local government. It's quite a top-down approach where things are done to people. Where's the bottom-up thinking? What do the speakers want ordinary people and businesses to do? 
and Graham declares himself as a recently retired civil senior civil servant at the uh, Department for Transport. And I should say that is a focus of this second seminar where we're looking at uh, digital democracy and engagement of populations. But nonetheless, um, Diane, do you want to kick off on that? <laughs> well, as I was saying, I'm, I'm definitely coming around to the view that you need um, a better understanding of what individuals themselves think makes them better off. Um, I do think our framework does speak to business. It really resonates with business and finance people to say, think about the portfolio as a whole, and then you think about the complementarities and substitutions between them. And they understand the concept of a balance sheet alongside a profit and loss account. Yeah. And um, you can use this kind of thinking to shape business decisions. So for example, to think about your potential returns as a business, um, it's factoring in climate risk or factoring in your um, ability to access people um, with high human capital in that lovely economics term, in other words, high skilled and healthy. Um, so I think it does actually speak to individual businesses. We just, um, in the Public Policy Institute, talk about public policy because that's what it says on the tin. Great. Michael, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been fond of quoting a lesson I learned from the People's Health Assembly in Thailand. And at the People's Health Assembly, they talk about the triangle that moves the mountain. And the three corners of the triangle that moves the mountain are government, knowledge, which includes academia, and people, society. And they argue you need all three of those to move the mountain the people part, civil society. And we saw in the early stages of the pandemic in Britain, and my colleagues in New Zealand talk about it, uh, what we saw was real community action. Um, people actually doing things because they knew it was for the common good, not just it might benefit themselves, but it might benefit others that the reason you needed to take protective action is to stop other people getting infected. The reason people came and knocked on doors of older people in their neighborhood was to ask, can I help you? Is there something I can do? Um, and we recognized. Now, my own sense, and it's a sense, I like to quote data, but I haven't got data on it, um, that when the government went all wobbly, and we started to get mixed messages about lockdown and whether we should be opening up or closing down or this. And one day it was safe and the next day it wasn't safe. And then much more, it's everybody for themselves. Um, because if you haven't got clear guidelines of what's needed, but certainly hearing accounts of what happened in New Zealand, where they, as we know, controlled the pandemic uh, brilliantly, they had both top down clear guidance from the top and real community spirit from people. So the questioner is right. We do I, the community. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very much a focus of the commission. And Diane, I'm trying to bring to mind the title of your recent book, and I'm not being paid for this. Um, is it Market States of People? The same three. Yeah. I would caution, though, about we did a little piece of work in the Institute, my colleagues Matthew Agawala and Marco Felici, early in the lockdown, first lockdown, looking at the mutual aid groups. And that was very unequally distributed. The better off the area, the more likely you were to have those yeah. inequalities pile on each other. Yeah. I'm now going to move on to a question from Harry Rutter, who uh, I work with as uh, he's co-chair of the Lancet Chatham House Commission. And uh, Harry's written quite a long question, so I'm going to try to uh, do justice. So Harry says, decisions on what gets measures take place in a political context with inherent imbalances in power. My concern is that what gets measures, measured gets gained. And the frameworks within which the things that get measured have values ascribed to them um, that are highly influential by political by politically powerful actors who tend not to be actors whose primary focus is on health or equity improvement. As Michael said, we know what needs to happen, but, ha but perhaps not how to make it happen. How might we give health and equity a more powerful voice in this? So um, I've already suggested that um, 
the health and inequality tribe uh, join forces with the wealth economy framework tribes um, as, as uh, one, one way uh, out of this. Um, Diane, why don't you kick off in a response to that and then I'll come to you, Michael. It's a complicated question. It's a good question. I do um, agree that measures are political and um, as I said in my introductory comments, they tell the narrative, they tell the story of what we think is happening in society. There are lens. And, um, but I think it's more complicated than that. There are um, uh, bodies of experts, statisticians, there's an international framework, there are intellectual arguments to be won about what shape these measures should take. And, and politicians do um, feel the need to live within those expert boundaries. They wouldn't, I, I think, um, pick on a number for no particular reason. Um, and events shape interest in statistics, uh, which measures as well. Uh, and so the interest in macroeconomic statistics varies over time. If you have a balance of payments crisis, it's a balance of payments numbers. If you have an unemployment crisis, it's the unemployment numbers. So um, I think it is correct to say that they're political, but it's a bit more nuanced. And there are definitely um, levers to change what gets looked at. I think we're at one of those moments of change where because the measures we have just clearly don't fit the way the economy is at the moment, not just for the reasons we've been talking about, but because of all the digital revolution too, that, uh, uh, there's a real opportunity and, and the pandemic itself and the sense people have of not going back to how things were before creates that moment of opportunity. Thank you. Michael, anything to... Well, um, I've repeated many times that I don't have a clue how to change um, elected politicians' minds. Um, I'm not even sure how their minds function some of the time. So I don't have a clue how to change their minds. So how to get them to take health equity seriously, I don't know. Uh, but what I would say is that the health equity message is spreading, no question about it. I talked at the beginning about local government. When we launched our Build Back Fairer report on the 15th of December, people had asked me, you know, is anyone listening to you? You make all these reports, anybody listening? On a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock in the morning before Christmas, 1,900 people tuned into the launch seminar on Zoom. Wow, people are listening. It, I don't, it may not be the ones in Westminster who are listening, although I did speak to some Westminster politicians this week um, from both political parties um, this week. So, but people are listening. And eventually, if our democracy functions, the politicians will listen to what people are concerned about. And I think, I would, wouldn't I, that health equity is a good way into the conversation. If you've got some general notion about inequality is good or bad, and you think inequality is good because I, for whatever reason, or you think it's bad for whatever reason, you know, we're used to these uh, arguments. They've gone on for a very long time. I think health equity is a way into the discussion. We've got good evidence that everybody concerned is concerned with health. Everybody. Sure. We've got good evidence for that. And if people suffer ill health through no fault of their own, which is what health inequities are about, then we've got a good way to have this conversation. And that then leads on to the broader issues of how we organize society. So I don't know, Michael or Diane, if you've had um, uh, an opportunity to look at the health index. So this was a measure that the previous um, Chief Medical Officer for England, uh, Professor Dame Sally Davis, proposed in her, I think it was 2018 annual report, that um, for health to be considered as an asset, it would be valuable to have an index. And so ONS has now developed and it's open for consultation. And I would suggest that um, anybody interested in this uh, on the call has a look at it um, in, in beta version. And the idea is that it would give a single number that would, uh, a, um, that's anchored to 2015. So this is just the beta version. So at 2015, health of 
England was 100. And so what you can see is that in 2018, I can't remember now, maybe it's uh, 98.7, something like that. So that one can track health in a single number and it comprises 58 different measures. I mean, it's quite complex um, and divided into three domains of um, healthy people, so that's uh, counting disease and disability, um, healthy lifestyles, so that's looking at behavioral risk factors, um, and healthy places. Um, so that's an attempt to try to bring together quite a lot of what we've been talking about just into one number, but it is health. Um, so what you can do is you can find out what the number is in different regions, but it's not health equity. So I don't know, I just wonder if that takes off, could we have a health and a health uh, equity number? Um, but I don't know if either of you had a look at that, but that is an attempt to bring everything we've been talking about in the health and health inequality domain into one number. Um, the idea being that uh, this is a, a more effective way of communicating uh, to decision makers about health as an asset of the population. Diane, do you want to comment? Well, that's about a theory of change, really, that policymakers need one number to persuade mm. them that something needs to be done. Mm. Um, the, the, the downside of having a single index is that you lose information by combining these things and you can't possibly get in all the information that, that you think is useful. But if, you, if your theory of change is that having one number will make policymakers pay more attention to it, then it's obviously uh, a, a worthwhile thing to do. I'm actually, I think, a bit more optimistic than Michael about the potential for changing political ideas because public philosophy does have these major swings from time to time. They're prompted by crises. We had one in 1979. It could well be that the pendulum is swinging the other way because of the um, actually multiple crises that we've been going through since since 2008 or nine. But you have my theory of change that you, you've got to have the ideas, the, the um, intellectual framework ready, and um, and then you've got to have the people pressure so that politicians know that this is on the minds of all their constituents. So I like Diane's answer um, because what I was going to say was a bit more critical. But I like Diane's answer because she talked about, well, the index might be useful as a theory of change. What, why I'm a bit critical is because the index combines causes and consequences and puts them all into one. And let me give you an example. We're doing a commission in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, North Africa and the Middle East. And there's another index that's widely used, the Human Development Index, and it combines life expectancy, education, and gross national income per person, adjusting for purchasing power parities. What's interesting about the region is not the level of the index, but if you, there's a group of countries in that region that come into the very high human development category, but if you look at their ranking on gross national income and their ranking on the HDI, the difference is hugely negative. In other words, to make tangible what I'm talking about, Qatar, its national income per person is number one richest country in the world. Its ranking on the HDI is 40, the gap's 39. In other words, their health, and educational level is far below what it could be given their national income. So I'm using that to make the case that there's much more they could be doing with the money they have in terms of improving things for people, education and health. So it's by separating causes and consequences or components, I think it's far more revealing. So that's why I say I'd like Diane's answer, because if your theory of change is that politicians need a number they can work with, fine. But I want to know your three the three components in the index, how they're moving and how the first two, the social conditions, the behaviors, relate to the third one, health, rather than just lumping them all together. So as Diane says, that's a theory of change. I call that a hypothesis of change and I'd want to see the evidence for it. So um, 
Here's a question for both of you from a colleague of yours, Diane, uh, Matthew Agawala. Hello, Matt. Uh, Matthew, um, what are economists missing or getting wrong on health? So either of you can kick off on that. Michael needs to kick off on okay. it. If I could start. Um, yep. Present company accepted. Um, two things that many economists get wrong on health. First, they equate health with health care. So the OECD publishes figures for spending on health. They don't mean spending on health. They mean spending on health care. If they were spending on health, they'd be spending on early child development and education and environment and so on. So one thing they get wrong is they use health as a short term for health care. And it annoys me considerably. The other, and it relates to the question about Anne Case and Angus Deaton. And I agree completely with the approach they've taken in Deaths of Despair. But I've lost count of the number of times where economists have been in the room. And I talk about the social gradient in health. And they say, have you thought of the possibility that people's health determines their income, not their income determines their health? And the accurate answer is yes, I've thought about that possibility because approximately 1,000 of your colleagues have asked me the same question time and time and time and time and time again. I did ask a very senior economist, why is it the default position of economists that they think health determines social conditions, not social conditions determine health? He said, because the equations are easier to solve. Oh, come on, really? You're telling me this whole intellectual edifice is because if you put health on the right side of the equation, you can solve it more easily than if it's on the left side. But so with distinguished exceptions, like Anne Case and Angus Deaton now, and Amartya Sen and a few others, uh, they're prepared to put health on the left side of the equation and social conditions on the right and say it goes the other way. Economists are obsessed with um, causal identification and I think over obsessed because in complex social environments it's just really hard to untangle these two way arrows and I think both are probably true. A colleague of mine has a phrase for it, he calls it the identification police trying to identify the direction of causality all the time. Um, and I'm not one of those but many economists certainly are. Matthew would better agree with me or we'll have words with him later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. That's great. Um, so if we can come on uh, to look at discounting. Um, so how can we overcome discounting of the future in political economic decision making, which is linked to short electoral cycles? Isn't it an ethical imperative to do so, given that we're currently using up natural and other capital at the expense of the well-being of future generations? It's been a big debate in um, environmental economics in particular, what discount rate should you use? Big debate after Nick Stern published his review and our colleague Parth Dasgupta was very involved in that. Um, our, our starting point is that you've got to measure the assets before you worry about the discount rate because otherwise you've got a zero. And, um, and, and certainly one might think of a lower discount rate than we have in many investment decisions taken um, in the recent past. I often mull over the Victorians who built the infrastructure on which we are still living to a large extent and wonder what it was about, about them that made them able to think 150 years or 200 years into the future and build for that. They certainly didn't have a five or 8% discount rate when they were making their investment decisions. And do, do you know what it was about the Victorians? Were they thinking about the future or did they? I think it was a positive vision and a sense of um, the agency to create that future, actually. Yeah, thanks. Michael. Well, inter intergenerational equity is of vital importance. Um, I'm very concerned with equity within the generation, but equity between the generations is of vital importance. And it seems to me that's a moral, not a technical decision. Um, I think Diane said before, we can, there needn't be a trade-off between 
the measurement and the models uh, that we need to have them at the same time. But once you say intergenerational equity is of vital importance, your rush automatically to have discounts needs to change a bit uh, because you're saying, I can think about the welfare of my grandchildren uh, and think what that means. I was just listening to uh, Jill Lepore talk about Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, Jill Lepore, the historian. And I have no idea whether Rachel Carson died, uh, discounted the future. But by golly, talking about the fact that the birds weren't singing in the springtime uh, had an enormous impact. Um, it started the environmental movement in a way. And um, if somebody had sidled up to her and said, no, you've got to discount um, the benefit of having birds sing in the spring trella, uh, because it's no point taking action once if you discount the benefit of hearing the birds sing, I think we would have got nowhere. And so the environmental movement kicked off in a way because we valued the birds singing in the spring and didn't discount the dollar value of that. To come on now to uh, possibly the last question. Um, so Ian Copley, he's saying, I agree that policymakers look for the easiest method of assessing value. <laughs> Uh, which is by measuring things. You can easily measure the costs of poor health, but how do you measure lack of self-esteem, lack of opportunity, hope and well-being? In addition, how do we measure how much it will cost to reverse this? Well, the first one, we can measure those things. Um, they, that's what people like you, Theresa do, and Diane and I, we can measure those things. Um, and we can also measure the consequences of those things, like deaths of despair. Um, so I think we can make it a concerted approach. And that's by no means uh, neglecting the importance of case histories, the importance of qualitative information. But I think we can measure those things and we can take them into account. It comes back to, uh, for my example of the well being of children. That's based on domains of, of measurement. Um, we could supplement that with more subjective uh, measurements. My guess is it would give similar answers. Uh, so it's not a hopeless idea that we can bring these to the concerns of policymakers by measuring and showing what's going on. Did you want to add to that? Yeah. Mulling over the earlier bit of the conversation about involving people more in understanding uh, their well being, I wonder if it's um, worth thinking about understanding more what they think they need to improve it also, rather than thinking about top down policy levers. Mm -hmm. And it might be very different for different people, and it might be very little for some people actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we think we have to apply the same policies to everybody and it's too costly to do we should talk to them about what they need. Yeah. Um, right, this I think will be uh, the last question. Um, how do we instigate more of these values and norms into our current way of organizing society politically and economically? I values emphasizing the common good over the private good. Isn't that an inherent failure of capitalism, which builds on the fact that there are differences in people's income and other factors, which we call inequalities? Well, I think, um, Theresa, the commission that you're co-chairing um, and what Diane and I have both been saying is this is a moment. This is a moment. Uh, lots of people have pointed out that um, on th the, during the first lockdown, when people went out on Thursday evening to clap mm -hmm. for healthcare workers, I would have been quite pleased if they'd also clapped for workers in social care uh, and maybe bus drivers mm -hmm. and perhaps the supermarket checkout people and the dustmen, mm -hmm. all the people who keep society functioning that we choose to ignore. Um, 
and not to value. I, I don't remember anybody clapping for bankers or hedge fund managers um, or CEOs of the FTSE 100. Um, so recognizing who keeps our society functioning, uh, who we need to function as a society and recognizing what we owe each other, uh, which was again, part of the message of the early lockdown. This is the moment to learn that lesson and not forget it uh, because we've all had to learn it. Now let's not forget it, let's act on it. Yeah. I don't think this is inherent in capitalism, which is very different in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but I think we are at a, a hinge, we're at a moment of, of change, where we're shifting from the, the individualism that we've experienced the past few decades. Thank you very much. Um, on that last point, Diane, um, I'm going to wrap up by thanking both of you for what I can see in the chat is, it's not just me appreciating what has been a really rich discussion between the two of you. And I leave this feeling positive um, and optimistic. As you both said, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for change. And we've talked, we started off talking about how to frame things for change. And I think both of you have given very rich examples of how we need both the narrative and the numbers. And you both got your own ideas about a theory of change. And uh, as, as you've um, suggested, Diane, it's about being prepared. And I think certainly the work that you and colleagues are doing on um, the wealth economy framework, I think that some of that, uh, to, to have that disseminated more broadly, I think would be really, really good. So more of us can engage in that. Um, but I think that both of you have given us um, a pause for thinking about how uh, the numbers are important, but on their own, they're not going to do it. And we have to be humble. We don't know quite what it is that's going to capture hearts and minds, as uh, Michael said, it's, it's a bird song or the missing bird song, we don't know. So I thank you both so much. And I'm going to end by reminding everybody that our next seminar is at an earlier time. It's at eight o'clock on a Monday morning, the 1st of February, but do please trade off the pleasure of an extended breakfast to come and hear Jeff Morgan talk with Minister Audrey Tang from Taiwan in a session chaired by Frank Kelly. I think that's going to be very special talking about a digital democracy. So I'm going to end and I think that you would both be deafened by applause were we in real life um, for what has been a fabulous seminar this afternoon. So thank you both so much. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.